All right, just keep your Bibles open there in Ecclesiastes chapter number 11. I'm going to read to you from Galatians 5, 22. And just a reminder, I've started a new series on the fruits of the Spirit. And it says in Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And last week I preached on love. The next one is joy. So today we'll be covering joy as a fruit of the Spirit. Then it says peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, what does it mean by against such there is no law? It means that if we are righteously uh, bringing forth this fruit of the Spirit, that our, our life represents this fruit that the Holy Spirit wants to uh, create in us, that we're not going to break God's laws. Okay, we're not going to sin. Okay, if you have these things, these are good, righteous emotions and characteristics that we want to build in our lives. And as I told you, the second one that we're looking at today is joy. Now, one thing that surprises me in the Christian life, just being amongst different churches, amongst different brethren, is how little joy there is in the lives of many believers. I mean, there are some believers that are recognized for their joy. They seem to be very happy. They're very uh, motivational. They encourage the brethren. And then there are some that are just very negative, right? Anytime there's bad news, they react in a very unpleasant way. And they try to breed a negative or, or depressing uh, emotion amongst others. And so, you know, joy is something that we need to develop in our lives. And I don't know about you, brethren, but I want to live a life of joy. Like, I'd rather live a short life and just live a happy life. They live a long life and be like depressed every day of my life, you know, just be downcast and upset. And so joy is definitely something we need to uh, develop. But look at Ecclesiastes 11 verse 7. Ecclesiastes 11. And actually, look at verse number 8 first. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 8. It says, But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all. Did you know it's possible to rejoice in every year or every day that you live in? That it's possible, right? If a man lived many years and rejoiced in them all. Now let's get the context of that. Let's start there in verse number seven. It says, truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. And so you might say, well, hold on. Is it really pleasant to behold the sun, Pastor Kevin? Because when I look at the sun, uh, it, it hurts my eyes. You know, I, I start to get some black spots and I can't see very well. It hurts the eyes to look directly at the sun. Yeah, but this is speaking about the, 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 the sunrise. You know, when the sun rises and you've got all those colors in the, in, the, in the sky, it's a beautiful thing. You can actually look at the sun as it starts to come over the horizon and it doesn't hurt the eyes at that point in time. And so it is a pleasant thing to see the sun rising and you soon see that this does have to tie in with an entire day. And then it says in verse number 8, but if a man lives many years and rejoice in them all yet let him remember the days of darkness for they shall be many all that cometh is vanity so I want you to just notice there in verse number eight there is we can rejoice in, in all the days of our life we can rejoice in all the years that God has given us but also that doesn't mean there's not going to be difficult times it doesn't mean that there's not going to be hardships because it says yet let him remember the days of darkness and like, like we saw you know beholding the sun well the days of darkness represents nights you know nighttime represents those days of darkness and then as the sun starts to rise then you can behold a pleasant thing and the idea there brethren is that when we go through hardships when we go through difficulties it will feel like times of darkness it'll feel like you're, you're downcast worried upset and, and you're going to go through those emotions as well but at the same time, you need to have the perspective that the sun will rise. That, that, the, you know, that, that day follows the night. And so if I'm going through difficulties, there will be a, a solution. We will come to a point where we overcome these difficulties that we experience in our life. But notice there, you know, you can rejoice in all the years of your life, but there will be days of darkness. I'm not here to tell you that, you know, the Christian life is a day where you'll never have difficulties. You'll never have sorrows. You, we all do. Whether you're saved or whether you're unsaved, we're going to have difficult days, right? We're going to have times when maybe our finances dry up and we're worried about providing for our families. We're going to have days where illnesses and maybe chronic diseases affect our bodies. As we get older, you're going to notice that your bodies don't react the same way they did when you were younger. You know, you can easily break a bone or these kinds of things and it will get you downcast. It will give you a day of darkness. But don't forget, God is saying that we can actually rejoice even in the face of darkness, okay? Look at verse number 9. It says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Now, for those of us that are adults, 
you know, our, our youth was a fun time, wasn't it? Like, we probably had a lot of enjoyment during our youth, and we look back at that and we go, wow, that went by really quickly. But you know, when it comes to the young people, when it comes to children, they feel like these days are taking so long, and they can't wait to grow up, and they can't wait to have all these different responsibilities. But the Bible's telling us, oh, young man or oh, young lady, uh, rejoice in the days of thy youth. You say, why should I rejoice in the days of my youth? Because you've got less responsibilities. You've got less accountabilities. You can actually enjoy your life. You can actually have a lot of fun knowing that mom and dad or your family, whoever's taking care of you, is, is there to, to watch over you. They're there to provide for you. You know, the days of the youth is a, is a, is a time when it, you can have a lot of fun. And, you know, I'm not one of these parents that are trying to get my kids to grow up and be like, you know, like a, you, you've just got to act like an adult, even at the age of five at the age of 10. No, I'm the kind of parent that I just want my kids to enjoy themselves. I want them to run around, have fun, kick a ball around, right? And, uh, you know, take church seriously. I think it's important for kids to sit in church and sit down and be quiet and listen to the preaching of God's Word. Hey, but when there's time of fun, I want my kids to have fun. I want them to rejoice in the days of their youth. So young people, I'm telling you, you know, the Lord wants you to rejoice. You know, we want to have joy in our lives. We want to develop this this fruit of the Spirit, well, it starts as a young child, enjoying the days that God has given you in your youth. But then it says this, in verse number 9, And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, look at this, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Think about that for a moment, okay? So for the young people, as, as we develop and get older, God does want us to enjoy our lives. You know, whatever it is that you like to do, God is saying, yeah, go about and do it. But also keep in mind that God is going to judge you for the wrong things. Meaning that we can find joy in wrong things. We can find joy in sin. We can find joy in rebellion. Now that's a wrong place to find joy. And so as we go about life and enjoying our lives and having fun, we need to assess what kind of joy are we having. Is it a joy that God wants us to rejoice in? Or is it something that is wicked and we really should not have a part in that? And if you do, you've got to remind yourself that God will judge you. God will bring His hammer down and judge you in His way. Look at verse number 10. It says, Therefore, so knowing that God will judge, therefore remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Okay, so the idea of obviously of vanity it means empty. So at some point, your youth is you're going to grow up. Your, your your youth will be over. Your your days of being young are going to be over. But remember, God will judge you even from the actions that you take as a, as a youth. So put away the evil from your flesh and make sure you rejoice in what God wants you to rejoice in. Okay, so as we go for these fruits of the spirit, you must remember. You know, that there's nothing wrong with emotions, there's nothing wrong with these characteristics, but God wants us to experience that in the right way. There's nothing wrong with love, like, like I covered last week, as long as we're loving the things that God loves, right? There's nothing wrong with hate, as long as we're hating the things that God hates. But the problem with love is when you love the things that God hates. Okay, you need to overcome that. Well, there's nothing wrong with joy. There's nothing wrong with being glad as long as you're enjoying the things that God wants you to enjoy your life in. But if you enjoy things that are wicked, well, obviously that, that would be a bad place that you're applying those emotions and those, that, that, you know, that outward feeling that comes from your heart. You're in Ecclesiastes, so turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, look at verse number 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse number 4. Because you might say, well, Pastor Kevin, how can I rejoice? You know, in all the days that God has given me, you know, when there are difficulties, there are hardships. And I'm not trying to deny that. Because in Ecclesiastes 3, 4, it says a time to weep. So there's a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. And so please, you know, don't walk away from this sermon, you know, thinking that I've told you there's never a time to mourn. There's never a time to have sorrow. Of course there is. Okay, and we saw that. Those are the days of darkness. There, there are challenging days that we have gone through or will go through, but don't forget there's light at the end of the tunnel. Okay? God has a solution in order to bring us out of that darkness and bring us into light, bring us into a place of laughter and joy. And so even though we experience all these emotions, the point I'm trying to bring forth here is that if joy is the fruit of the Spirit, 
That ought to be the characteristic that you're known for as a Christian. Okay? It's not, you know, I'm not saying there's never a, a time to not mourn. I'm, I'm saying there is a time for that. But when people think about your life, your Christian life, do they think, hey, this is a happy person? This is a person who finds joy in the Lord, who finds joy in what God has given them. Or do people look at you and say, well, this person's really depressing. They're really cast down all the time. They're really negative all the time. Okay? And if that's you, then this is a fruit of the Spirit that needs to be developed in your life. So how do I develop these fruits? Don't forget, it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So it's our time that we spend in the Holy Spirit. It's a time that we walk in the Spirit, we walk after God's ways. And the Holy Spirit will do the work in our lives to develop this okay? in, our, in, our, in our lives. Can you please now turn to Proverbs chapter 2? Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. Because I do want to talk about finding joy in wicked things at the moment, okay? Proverbs chapter 2. And I want to show you that it is possible to find joy in wicked things. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse number 12. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse number 12. We will read verse number 10 soon, but let's just start there in verse number 12. It says, To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things. I want to stop there for a moment. You know, there are people that, are e- that, that's, that desire to do evil to us. There are people that seek to cause us to fall, but also to turn against the Lord, to sin. Look at verse number 13. Who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. Look at verse number 14. Who rejoice. Hey, we're called to have joy, aren't we? But look, these people rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of of the wicked. So you can see there that it is possible to rejoice in evil things. It's, it is possible to rejoice in sin. And even in Hebrews chapter 11, you don't need to turn there, talking about Moses in verse 24, it says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to fl- suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of, uh, in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So what do we learn there? Is that Moses had a decision to make. Do I suffer for the cause of Christ? Or do I enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season? And he chose to suffer the reproach of Christ. He's decided to suffer with the people of God instead of enjoying sin. And brethren, this is, this is one of the challenges that we have in our life. The reason you sin, yes, is because we have a fallen sinful flesh. We have a fallen sinful nature about us. But also because sin is enjoyable. That's why you sin. That's why you go back to your old sins. That's why, you know, even when you sin, you're like, oh, I can't believe I did that. And you go back to the sin again, it's because you find joy in that sin. But don't forget that joy, that enjoyment or the pleasures of that sin is only for a season. It's only for a season. It's short-lived. Whereas the joy that God gives us is forever. It's eternal. Okay? So don't forget that. Don't forget that the reason you go and sin is because there is pleasure. There is joy. You can enjoy sin. And that's the, that's the habit you fall into. You know, you know for a period of time, I actually enjoy doing this. But if you're a believer, you have the Holy Ghost in you. After you've done that, you're going to feel regret. You're going to feel guilt. You're going to be like, man, I've grieved the Holy Spirit of God within me. And you need to find joy in the right things. Okay? So if, you, if you're struggling with sin because you enjoy it, you need to say, well, I need to replace that enjoyment of wicked, evil things and put that joy into the Lord. What the Lord wants me to rejoice in. Now, you should still be there in Proverbs chapter 2 and verse number 10. If we just backtrack a little bit, it tells us how we can overcome uh, the evil man who seeks joy or seeks uh, to rejoice in evil things. Verse number 10, Proverbs chapter 2, verse number 10. I want you to notice these words. It says, when wisdom, that's word number one, when wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge, there's the other word, second word, is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion, that's the third word, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding, that's the fourth word, shall keep thee. Say, keep you from what? Well, there, verse number 12, it will keep you to deliver thee from the way of the evil man. Remember, the evil man rejoices in 
doing wickedness. And so God tells us, in order for us to not enjoy, or not to give in to enjoying what is evil, we need to have wisdom, knowledge, discretion, and understanding. You say, well, those four words sound very familiar, to, uh, you know, similar to me. You know, are there any differences? Let me help you understand what, what these words mean. First of all, let's talk about understanding. Understanding is the ability to comprehend the information. Okay, right now, as I preach, I'm desiring that you understand. So that means I've got to speak with clarity. I've got to maybe repeat myself a few times because I want you to uh, comprehend the information. Okay, and the next one is knowledge. What is knowledge? Well, once you have comprehended the information, it's the attainment of truths and facts. Okay, knowledge is the attainment of truth and facts. Okay, discretion. What's discretion? Discretion is making correct judgment on the knowledge you've attained. So you attain knowledge. All right. Now, how do I work through this information that I have to make the right decisions? And then you've got wisdom. Wisdom is the exercise or the application of the knowledge. Okay, so you might go to to uh, school and or you know you might get an apprenticeship and you learn that but wisdom is taking what you learn and applying it you know in in real life okay that's that's about that's kind of like being the doer of the word not just the hearer of the word but you go and you take what you've learned and you apply it that is wisdom okay it's the application of uh or the uh exercise of the of of knowledge okay let me give you a quick example of this you know, uh, let's talk about salvation. When you go and you preach the gospel to somebody that is lost, the first thing you want to do is to cause them to understand, isn't it? Okay, understanding again is the ability to comprehend the information. And so you want to make sure that your presentation is clear. You get out there, it's a clear presentation, it, it's, it's simple to understand because you want them to comprehend what you're saying. You know, you might even allow them to ask questions. You know, if they get stuck on something, because you want them to understand. Then the next step is knowledge. You want them to not just understand what you're saying, but you want them to uh, attain the truths and the facts that you've told them, the verses that you told them, right? This is why after the presentation, we go back and we start asking questions. So would you admit that you're a sinner? Yes. According to the Bible, where do sinners go if they don't believe in Jesus? Oh, they go to hell. So by repeating this stuff and by saying it correctly, you know they have obtained okay, the knowledge. They, they've got the knowledge that you wanted to give them. The next step is discretion. Okay, what's discretion once again? It's making correct judgment on the knowledge they've attained. So now they've got to balance what they've been told to go to heaven, the good works, the false gospels, and what you've just told them. And they've got to use discretion to decide which one is correct. Okay, And then lastly, wisdom. That's the exercise or the application of the knowledge. That's when we want them to, okay, now that you've, you've, made, you've used discretion to decide which one's correct, we want you to end up you know, knowing that believing on Jesus Christ and Him alone is the way to go. So you want to ex cause them to exercise and place their faith on Jesus Christ. We often look at them calling upon the name of the Lord as that expression of them having placed their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, So I just want you to understand, these ideas are, con are concepts that we need to uh, understand and accept. And, you know, and this will keep us from rejoicing in evil or falling against wicked people that are trying to cause us to, you know, that, that are desiring to rejoice in, in our evil, in, in our destruction. And of course, this comes from the Word of God, brethren. You know, but if you want to find joy, you need to know your Bibles even better. Okay, to gain understanding, to gain wisdom, to use this question, to apply what it is that God wants you to apply in your life. The only way you get this, brethren, is by knowing your Bible. Okay, you want more joy? Read your Bible. Okay, I, I would say if you struggle with depression, you're upset, you know, you're constantly worried, it's probably because you just don't pick up your Bible enough. Okay, I'm saying, I'm saying that if that's part of your life, that's a significant portion of your life being cast down and negative and upset, it, all it means, brethren, is you've got to pick up your Bible more. Okay, ask God to give you knowledge, wisdom, to be able to rejoice in the right things. Okay, because it's through the Word of God that we understand what it is that we can rejoice in. And so the next half of this sermon is I want to show you 10 things. And of course, there are more. 
You read your Bible, you'll find more things. But 10 things that you should be finding joy in. 10 things that you should be finding joy in. Can you please turn to Psalm 118? Psalm 118, verse number 24. Psalm 118, verse number 24. And we've already sort of begun with this one at the very beginning of the sermon. But let's look at this again. Psalm 118, verse number 24. Psalm 118, verse 24 reads, This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, the day the Lord hath made is not just Sunday. It's not Monday, just Monday. It's every day. It's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Every day that you wake up to is a day that the Lord hath made. Okay? That means if you're going to go through... I don't know, maybe right now you're, you're facing some trial, some difficulty. Well, you know what? God's giving you Sunday right now so you can rejoice. Okay? Maybe tomorrow you're going to work and you know you're going to be facing some problems at work and it's getting you worried right now, being cast out. Well, you know what? Monday's the day that the Lord has given you as well. It's the day the Lord has made and God tells you you ought to rejoice in that day. Just like we looked at earlier, you know, that we ought to rejoice in all the years that God has given us. Well, He also wants us to rejoice in every day that He has made. Because don't forget, He made that day. He made today. Okay? And He's given us the ability to experience this day. All right? And don't forget, it's the Lord that has made it. You know? Some people hate Mondays. Ah, oh, Monday. Hate Mondays, right? You hear about that, right? They hate Mondays because it's the first day of work. Ah, oh, man. What? Well, that's a bad attitude to have. Yeah. God's given you that day. Okay? So people, people hate different days of the week, but it's just ridiculous because every day God has given you. And we won't go into that any further. I'm sure you understand that you ought to rejoice in every day that you have. Now you're in Psalm, so please turn to Psalm 113. Psalm 113. Psalm 113. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Proverbs 5.18. Proverbs 5.18, which reads, Let thy fountain be blessed, look at this, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Brethren, do you find joy in your spouse? Do you look at your wife and go, Man, I, I have so much joy in my wife. Do you look at your husband and say, you know, I have so much joy. I rejoice with my husband. I'm so thankful that God has given me this person. Well, you know what? The second uh, thing that you ought to find joy in is your family. That's the second thing, right? Find joy in your family. I'm seeing people laugh, right? So, so we, we know, obviously, there are times we, we struggle. We might argue and have argue, you know, fights and arguments. But don't forget, your, your Lord God has given you your spouse. Okay? We ought to find joy in our family. Because listen... You spend most of your time with your family. I mean, most of the hours of your day, you're going to be with your family, right? Uh, for those that go to work, you want to come home and not just come, oh, man, I've got to come home to the kids. I've got to come home to the spouse. Like, you just spend a whole time, you know, for the men, you just spend 8, 10, 12 hours at work or something. I'm sure the next thing you want to experience is some joy in your day. And so you go home, right, and, you know, you experience your family. And, you know, this is something that I had to work in in my life because, you know, we all grow and mature. And, you know, having a wife is a big change to how you used to live your life before when you were single. And then the next big change is the children that come along, right? And you've got to start to adjust to these things. And the things that you used to doing when you were single, you realize you're going to have to prioritize, okay? Those things that I used to enjoy, my hobbies, hanging out with my mates, uh, I, I don't have time for that anymore because I've got to work, I've got to go, I've got a wife, I've got kids, and you've got to learn how to prioritize. And I remember, uh, and I don't mind saying this because, you know, we all have to grow up and, and learn, but I remember after getting married and having a few kids that, you know, I, 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 I kind of was struggling with, you know, trying to maintain the friends that I had in high school, trying to maintain relationships that I developed in the workforce where they wanted to hang out and kick a ball, you know, play some indoor soccer or something. And also the idea of having to come home and have a wife and children that you've got to spend time with, right? And, and nurture and, and be with. And I, I just, I was struggling with this a lot. And I had to come to a point in my mind where I just realized, well, Lord, you know, more important, the most important thing that I have is my family. And I have to prioritize them. And so I had to start saying no 
No to the friends, no to the work colleagues. No, no I, have to, I, I need to spend time with my wife. I've just spent eight hours with you. I'm not going to spend any more time with you. I've got to go and spend time with my wife and kids. You're in Psalm 113, verse number 9. Psalm 113, verse number 9. It says, He maketh the barren woman to keep house. Look at this. And to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Hey, you know what? Mothers, you know what you ought to find joy in? Your children. God wants you to make you a joyful mother of children. You know what that means? That means there ought to be more joy in your life after having kids than the joy that you had before having kids. And notice it says, He maketh the barren woman to keep house. You know, before I married Christina, she was told that she would be barren. She was told that she would never be able to have kids. Obviously, God had a different plan. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm so, I'm, look, I'm, I'm, you know, again, I was a young man. I'm just stupid. I'm being brainwashed by the world. I'm thinking, well, if we don't have kids, we don't have kids. Who cares? Okay? But now I look back at that and I just realize how stupid, how foolish was I to have that mentality, right? But, you know, now that I have kids, I, that's, it's wonderful, right? God has given us children to rejoice in. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord has given you this. So, mothers, please... You know, I know we live in a world that says, well, you know, being a mother, staying home and keeping the house, you know, that's just, uh, you know, that's, that's old fashioned and, you know, that's, the, that's being uneducated. You're not going to find fulfillment in your life when they say that. They think, they think you find fulfillment in the workplace. They, they think they find, you find fulfillment by not having kids or looking after other people's kids. Go work in a childcare, look after other people's kids. What in the world? You know? Or, or working for some other man, right? In, in the workforce. No. Listen, they're not, they're not happy. Okay? And the reason they try to make mothers that stay at home who raise their kids unhappy is because they're unhappy themselves. You know, this is just a common thing. People that are not happy, they don't like people that are happy. And they'll try to bring them down to their level. And so that's why they criticize mothers who stay home, because they know they're actually having a life that brings joy. All right, so we ought to find joy in our husband and wife, and we ought to find joy in our children. I'll just read another passage to you, Proverbs 23, 24, that says, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. Greatly rejoice, fathers. And he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Notice it doesn't say that just having children will cause you to rejoice. Just having children will cause you to be joy. No. It says the father of the righteous. So listen, having children is one thing. Anybody can have children. Okay? I know we have 11 kids, but honestly, it's not that amazing. It's not amazing having 11 kids. Anybody can do that. Okay? But what you need to do, the difficult part, is raising a righteous generation. Raising your children to know what it is to do good, what it is to be righteous, to please their parents, to please the Lord. This is what's impressive. Yeah. Okay, so if you only have a couple of kids, that's all God has given you. You know, don't, don't think, oh, well, you know, this other family has 11. You don't know, because no, the 11 could be wild children, okay, who, who aren't righteous. And look, the parents aren't going to find joy in that. You might have a couple of kids, and they're righteous, and they, they're good, and they're wise. You train them to know the things of the Lord. You're going to find more joy in those few kids that you have than a family that has a great number of kids that are just wild, uncontrolled, and rebellious. Okay? So keep that in mind, okay? That, yes, God wants us to be find joy in our children as long as we raise them right. Because if you don't raise them right, they're not going to bring you joy. They're going to bring you hardship. They're going to cause heartbreak, okay? When you see that they go about life and destroying themselves. You're still in Psalms, so please go to Psalm 122. Psalm 122. So the first thing to find joy in was every day that God has given you. The second thing was family. And the third thing is church. Church ought to be a place where you find joy in. And the fact that you're here this morning tells me you enjoy church. Okay, you know, come in here and, you know, we're outdoors a little bit and, you know, Things aren't the way we're, we're comfortable, that we actually like things to be. But the fact that you're still in church, wanting to know God's word and, and to worship Him and to be with, with brethren, shows me you find joy in church. It says in Psalm 122 verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now I want to talk to the kids right now. 
Because I know when it comes to the children, it's your parents that bring you to church. Right? It's your parents that say, all right, come on, get up early. Get ready for church. We're going to church. Okay? And so when your parents come to you and say, let us go uh, to the house of the Lord, into the house of the Lord, are you glad, children, when your parents say that? Are you glad when your parents come, come on, get up early. It's time for church. We've got to get there. Are you like, yes, I can't wait to get there. Right? Is that you? Well, if it's not, this is something you need to develop in your life. You've got to find joy, gladness. God has given us church. God has given us a, His house so we can come and learn more about Him. But you know what? It's not just coming. The point here, it's not just being here physically, but coming to church with joy. It's about being at church spiritually. It's about being at church mentally as well. This is a place that I want to be. This is a place where I know I'm going to find joy in the Lord for a period of time while we're having church service. Can you please turn to 2 John chapter 12? 2 John chapter 12. 2 John chapter 12. This ties in with church as well, but it's a little bit different. 2 John chapter 12. Sorry, 2 John 12. 2 John 12. There is no chapter 12. Okay, but 2 John verse 12. 2 John verse 12 says, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink. Look at this. But I trust to come unto you. So look, John, yeah, he's writing things, but his real desire is to come to the brethren. Because then it says, and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Okay? Now, John, yeah, he was writing this epistle, uh, but he says, look, I'd much rather be with you. I'd much rather be face to face with you so our joy can be full. The fourth place that you ought to have joy in is fellowship with the brethren. Okay, so yeah, church is important. Church is wonderful. And you know, some people come to church, but then as soon as the church service is over, all right, let's get out of here. <laughs> I don't want to talk to, I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to see that person. Because last week they didn't say hello to me, so I don't want to see them this week and, I, and you're off. Okay, that's not how church ought to be. Church ought to be a place where you find joy uh, in the fellowship that you have with the brethren. This means you have to step out of your comfort zone. And say, so, you know what, I might not be necessarily an outgoing person. I might, I might be a bit of a shy person. I might be a bit introverted in my personality. But I know God wants this fruit in my life to find joy in my brethren. So I'm going to step out and I'm going to talk. I'm going to step out and greet. I'm going to step out and ask them about their day. I'm going to ask them about their week. I'm going to find out about their families. I'm going to find out about their workplace. So I have something that I can talk to them about. Okay? And this is about... And when you do that, brethren, when you put that effort in, you'll find that it gives you a lot of joy. A lot of joy. Okay? And this is something we need to find joy in. And I, and I, I said this last week. Sometimes the brethren, we're just not going to see eye to eye. Sometimes we're going to rub each other the wrong way. We're just going to get, you know, frustrated a little bit. But even if that's the case, we're still commanded to love. We're still commanded to find joy in our brethren. Okay, so let this be a fruit that the Holy Spirit works in your life. Can you now please turn to James? James chapter 1. James chapter 1. As we go through these 10 things, I just want you to assess yourself. Do I find joy in all these things that we've covered today? And if you say, well, I, I honestly, and you don't have to tell me, this is for yourself, between you and God. You say, there are honestly th some things that I just do not find joy in. Well, you need to, through the Holy Spirit of God, develop this in your life. Okay? Otherwise, you're missing out on the joy that God wants you to have in life. And I think we all agree, we want to have happy lives. Okay? So you've got to find joy in all these things that God has given us. You're, you're turning to James chapter 1, verse number 2. James chapter 1, verse number 2. Maybe so far, the first four things for you are very easy to find joy in. But this one is a hard one, right? Verse number 5, sorry, verse number 2. It says, my brethren, count it all joy. Now, let's stop there. Count it all joy. Yeah, when, when things are going great. Well, yeah, that too, okay? But it says here, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, 
Let him ask of God. We looked at that before when we look at Proverbs. Alright? If you need wisdom, ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So point number five is we ought to find joy in the midst of difficulties. In the midst of difficulties. When we face all kinds of different temptations, different struggles, different trials in our life, brethren, you need to find joy in that. You know, it's kind of like what we started, you know? It's night, you don't necessarily find joy in the night, but you know that eventually that sun is going to rise. You know that eventually a new day is around the corner. Well, you know what? When it comes to the difficulties that we go through, you need to pause for a moment and say, well, why am I going through this difficulty? Why am I going through this challenge? Is God chastising me? Or is this just something else that has developed because we live in a cursed world? Well, Reverend, every time you face some trial or difficulty, you'll say, you know what, I'm going to find joy in this. I'm going to count it all joy because I know God's going to use this to work in my life. He's going to develop patience. He's going to cause me to be perfect. That's well-rounded, complete, right? Entire, wanting nothing. And if you're struggling, you go, I, I just don't know why I'm going through this difficulty, Lord. Well, then you go to God. If you lack wisdom, you go to God. You go to His Word and find out, Lord, why am I going through these challenges? Because there is a reason for it. Every time you go through difficulty, there's a reason, there's a purpose that God is allowing you to go through it. Okay? And so we ought to find joy in the midst of difficulties. And you know what? With the last, say, year or so, with all this COVID restrictions, border closures, different mandates, it's been a time of difficulty. Okay? You can either have one attitude that goes, well, I, just, I don't like any of this. I'm not happy with this. Or you can just be, you know what? I'm going to count all joy. This is all joy. You know, God is going to use this to work in my life to develop something that I need, you know, that I desperately need in my life. And again, if you don't know what that is, go to the Lord and ask Him for wisdom. All right, can you please turn to Proverbs 15, Proverbs 15, verse 23, Proverbs 15, verse 23. The next one I have is, find joy in the passing on of good counsel or advice. Okay, the passing on of good counsel or advice. Proverbs 15, verse 23, Proverbs 15, verse 23. It says, a man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. And a word spoken in due season, how good is it? All right, so you know what? We need to be mindful about our mouths because we say a lot of stupid and foolish things. Okay? Even I'd say stupid and foolish things, brethren. Okay? I'm not saying that I'm great and wonderful and there's only wisdom and counsel and great godly advice coming from this mouth. Not all the time. Okay, but one thing we need to work on is how we speak. Okay, if we speak good, godly counsel, good advice, you know, we say words that encourage us a brother in the Lord, a sister in the Lord. You know what? The Bible says we can find joy in that. Why? Because we've been able to influence others in a positive way. We've been able to encourage others. We can find joy in that. Have you ever had a situation where, you know, a, a brother or sister has been downcast, upset, you've come alongside them, you've said some great words, you know what, even sometimes just greeting someone, you know, lifts up someone's spirit. You know, you've said something and they've been able to, you know, get out of that and they're thankful and say, thank you, brother, thank you, sister, uh, for encouraging me. You know what, they, they ought to be joined that, brethren. Okay, they ought to be joined that. You know, when it comes to preaching, and I talk to the, the, the different preachers uh, you know, and, and more often than not, preachers don't like to listen to their own sermons afterwards. Right? They get recorded, put on YouTube. Generally speaking, sometimes you do go back and listen to it to learn, to you know, criticize how you presented something, to make improvements for the future. But generally speaking, people don't like going back and listening to their voice. And, oh man, look, look at that mistake that I made. And, oh man, I really messed up. But here's the thing. By, by preaching, you've actually imparted a lot of knowledge a lot of wisdom, a lot of counsel, a lot of advice. And so really you ought to be finding joy when you get the opportunity to come behind the pulpit and preach the Word of God. As long as you are preaching the words of God, you are preaching words that are fit at the right season. Okay, And you ought to find joy in that. Can you please turn to uh, Psalm 30? Go to Psalm 30, please. Psalm 30. I'm up to the seventh thing that we ought to find joy in. 
Psalm 30. The same thing, and again, this is kind of difficult as well. It, it's similar to finding joy in the midst of difficulties. Because this can be difficult, okay? But Psalm 30 verse 4, it says, Psalm 30 verse 4. It says, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. Look at verse number 5. For His anger, to so whose anger? The Lord's anger, okay? For His anger endureth but a moment. In His favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night. So there's the same idea of a night and a day. Weeping may endure for a night. Look at this. But joy cometh in the morning. But joy cometh in the morning. What is this about? This is about the chastisement of the Lord. You know what? You ought to find joy when God takes you and gives you a good smack. Okay? When God takes you and chastises you, corrects you for something wrong that you've done. Amen. You know, children ought to rejoice as well if they have loving parents that chastise and correct their children when they do wrong. Now notice there, when we are being chastised, when we are being corrected, when we are facing the anger of the Lord, it says the anger endureth but a moment. Okay? The anger is just a moment. In His favor is life. The purpose you chastise is to give somebody a better life. Okay? Not to destroy, but to give them a better life. Then it says, weeping may endure for a night. So yeah, when you get chastised, uh, and if you chastise children, you know there's a lot of weeping, okay? But the weeping, it's just for a moment, it's just for the night, that's the part that feels bad, but then joy cometh in the morning, okay? So my experience with chastising children, yeah, it's not wonderful. I, I don't enjoy taking out the rod and applying it to the backside of my kids, okay? I mean, I, I don't know, it's not like I'm, uh, I can't wait to do that, okay? There's tears. You know, there's the anger that came from your child being disobedient. But listen, once it's done and they apologize and, and, and you know, you, you forgive them, you ought to just be able to move on from there and say, well, the night's over. That was just for a moment. That was just for a season. Now it's morning. Now we can rejoice. And my experience is quite often when you, when you apply that rod, it's almost like the child instinctively knows they needed that so they can move on with their lives. So they can move on and actually be happy. Okay, and so once you chastise and you've done it properly, you know you don't you ought not to bring it back up. Okay, you just go well, hey, it's over. You've apologized. I've forgiven you. Let's forget it. Let's forgive and forget the way God does, and let's just move on forward and have fun. Okay, well that's how it is with God. God chastises you. There might be some weeping. There might be some hardship. But you have to find joy in that, knowing that it's for my profit. It's for my life. God wants to develop in me, and I know that moving forward. We're going to have a great time. Okay? The morning's going to rise and I'm going to have a great time with the Lord. I'm thankful that He corrected me in this place because He could have destroyed my life. Okay? So we ought to find joy in the chastisement of the Lord. Can you please go back to Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse number 18. Ecclesiastes 5, 18. And before we read this, we know that we shouldn't be Christians. Mm. that are just trying to amass material wealth in life. We ought not to be Christians that just love money, you know, and, and just love the temple things. And we know it's all going to burn up. We're not going to take it with us to heaven, okay? We ought to have our mindset on eternal matters, okay? But when we preach these things, at the same time, we don't want to be completely removed from this world. Because there is a lot to enjoy in this world, okay? So when you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse number 18, Ecclesiastes 5 verse number 18, it says, Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink, look at this, and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, look at this, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. So when it comes to our possessions, our material wealth, the, the things that you have, you know why you have it? Because God gave it to you. And the Bible's telling us that we ought to enjoy our possessions. We ought to enjoy what God has given us. You know, I've got this house. I should not go, well, look at that double story house back there. I wish God gave me a double story house. 
You know, like, what, why? God did not give me that. Or look at that, you know, that car over there, man, that sporty, slick car. You know, I wish God gave Listen, God gave me the van. I have to rejoice in the van right, that God has given me, right? And so, listen, there's nothing wrong with enjoying what God has given us. You know what? We live in a blessed country. We have a lot of material wealth, all of us. Sometimes we're able to go out on holidays and enjoy ourselves. Listen, there's nothing wrong with enjoying those things. So long as God has given us, so long as you've not gone and, and done wickedly, you know, got into drug dealing or something, right? And, and, and got your wealth by wicked ways. As long as you've worked for it, brethren, as long as the Lord's provided for that, hey, re- rejoice, enjoy what you have. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, don't, don't feel that like that's a bad thing. God is the one that's given you the possessions that you have. Look at verse number 19. We get to the next point. Verse number 19. It says, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion. Look at this. And to rejoice in his labor. And that's your, your workplace. That's your job. All right? Or for the mothers. That's raising the children. Rejoice in his labor. Look at this. It is the gift of God. You know, your workplace is the gift of God. Okay, so man, I don't like where I work. Well, God gave, gave you a gift. You know, you're going to just whine and complain about where you work. You'll whine and complain about the job God has given you. Okay, so if that's you, you just whine and complain. You land this job. Ah, oh, I can't do this job. Hey, this job, ah, oh, this problem with this job. This job, ah, oh, I've got a problem with this. Listen, God's given you that as a gift. That's right. Find joy in the job that God has given you because it's through that job, it's through that work, it's through that labor that God has given you the material possessions that you do have so you can rejoice in that as well. You know, again, we spend a lot of hours at work, don't we, man? You know, get out there, 8, 10, 12 hours, sometimes more even. It's a lot of hours. It's a lot of time of your day. Well, God wants you to find joy in it. You know, if you find joy in it, you're going to work better. You're going to be more effective. You're going to be a great employee. Okay, and you're just going to enjoy life a lot more. You're not going to come home irritated and angry and and take it out on the family when you get home. Okay, as long as you find joy in your work, you've got to find the joy. So how do I start? Make God your employer. Say, whoever whoever my boss is, whoever sits in in that office, okay, I'm going to pretend it's Jesus Christ. And whatever work I have, I'm doing a work for Christ. I'm working because God has given me this gift. God has given me, has provided this employment for me to do my job. And again, for the mothers, you know, for those that stay home. Hey, you got work as well. You're laboring as well. You know, taking uh, keep of the house and watching the children. Hey, you got to find joy in that as well. Find joy, okay, in, in what God has given you. Now, lastly, can you please turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 1. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 1. The last thing, and I suppose the most important thing that we ought to find joy in, just there in Philippians 3, verse number 1. Philippians 3, 1, it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. What a great God that we serve. I'm glad we don't have to rejoice in the God of Hinduism. Or the gods of Buddhism, right? Or the god of Islam. Those aren't great gods. They didn't die for me. That's right. All right? We ought to rejoice in the Lord. Look at this. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Verse number two beware of gods, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. Look at this. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence. In the flesh. Amen. Again, this is just another passage that reinforces the deity of Christ. Because we're commanded, verse number three, to rejoice in Christ Jesus. And verse number one said, rejoice in the Lord. So Christ Jesus, Jesus is the Lord. Yep. Jesus is God. Okay? And so we ought to find joy in our Savior, in our Lord. Okay? Uh, the best thing to do, brethren, is spend time with the Lord a little bit every day. We all should be able to just set aside 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour of a day just to spend time with the Lord. Just to pray unto Him, to open up His Word. Maybe to sing a hymn on your own if you have to or with the family. To spend time and there's going to be great joy in the Lord when you remember He's watching over you. He's protecting you. He's giving you all these other nine things that we've looked at so far that you can have a joyful life. And 
it's, it's so important. I'm going to read to you from Habakkuk 3.18. It says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Salvation ought to be something you constantly bring back, back up. I, I don't care how bad things get on this earth. I don't care how uh, low your bank account gets. I don't, I don't care how much people reject you or hate you or, or what situation you may go through. You know, how bad your body may get with sicknesses and illnesses and difficulties that you can get. You know, none of that compares to the salvation that God has given us. Amen. None of it can even come close to knowing that we've been saved from hell, been saved from our sins, and we're going to spend eternity with God forever. Saved forever. What great joy. So, brethren, whatever hardship you go through, please just stop and say, well, at least I'm saved. At least I'm going to heaven. You know, I might be suffering from this illness and this ailment. It's going to give me a shorter life. Well, then I'm going to be in heaven closer and earlier than I would have been if I had full health. As long as we find joy in the salvation of God. You're in Philippians. Let's go to Philippians 4, verse 4. Philippians 4, 4. <coughs> Philippians 4, 4 reads, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. So how often should we rejoice in the Lord? Always. All the time. Everywhere you go, wherever you're at, uh, brethren, you need to learn how to rejoice in the Lord. I don't know how bad things are going to get in this world. I don't know when persecution is really going to rise against the people of God. I don't know when the tribulation to come will, you know, will come. I, I don't know when these things get, brethren. But you know what? If one day we're arrested or something, you know, you're put in solitary confinement, you know, you're locked up for what you believe or who you are, you know what? The Bible tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. Even in that condition. We would say, say, well, you know what? I'm suffering for the cause of Christ. I'm going to be rewarded by Christ for this suffering. So you know what? I don't care. I'm going to rejoice yeah, in true. whatever situation I find myself in. One more verse and then we'll finish up. Please go to Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. Which ties in, but I think it's a good conclusion for all of the above. While you turn there, I'm just going to read to you what those 10 things are once again. Number one, we ought to rejoice every day. Number two, we ought to rejoice in our families. Three, we ought to rejoice in the church. Four, we ought to rejoice in the fellowship of the brethren. Number five, we ought to rejoice in the midst of difficulties. Number six, we ought to rejoice in the passing on of good counsel or advice. Number seven, we ought to rejoice in the chastisement of the Lord. Number eight, we ought to rejoice in the possessions that God has given us. Number nine, we ought to rejoice in the work that God has given us. And number ten, we ought to rejoice in the Lord. But there uh, in uh, Psalm 16, verse 11, Psalm 16, verse 11, because if you are telling me, Pastor Kevin, I just, well, you don't tell me, you give it to yourself, talk to the Lord. But if you say, I, I, you know, there are some things in these ten, list of ten that I just don't find joy in, well, this is where you're going to find the joy, okay? Psalm 16, verse 11. It says, That will show me the path of life. Look at this. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So if you're lacking joy in one of these areas, you know what you need to do? You need to get close to the Lord. You need to get in the presence of the Lord. Because yep. in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy at thy right hand. That's how close we ought to be. Okay? Matthias, come up here quickly. This is my right hand. There's Matthias at my right hand. That's how close... We ought to be to the Lord. Amen. Where the Lord can stretch out, He's got His right hand resting upon you. You can sit down, okay? So, in God's presence, at His right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. You say, God, I hate my job. Well, you know what? Spend time in the presence of God. Get close to the Lord. Ask the Lord, why did you give me this specific job? It seems to be overly difficult. There are overly difficult people that I have to work in. God will give you the wisdom. God will impart that knowledge to you and help you understand why you have that job. <clears throat> you know, and I, I, I hate talking about myself, but it's the only experience that I, I've lived. Okay? But you know, I, I worked a job where I was, you know, I talked to my wife. I was traveling a lot. I was spending a lot of time away from my family, from my wife. You know, they, I, I'd go maximum a week away from the home. You know, they wanted me there longer sometimes, a fortnight, a month in other places, and I said, I can't. I'm going to go for a week. I've got a family and kids to look after. 
And I, 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 at first, it's kind of exciting, traveling, it's hard fun. Eventually, you know, when you have other responsibilities, or, you know, I had to, I was called to preach to church, and then I had to ring my pastor, sorry, pastor, I can't, I, I've got to fly. I've got to fly this Sunday to get to wherever, to be there for Monday, I can't preach. And, you know, I was getting upset, I was getting depressed, and I just wondered, Lord, why have you given me this work? Well, I know now, <laughs> okay? I know now, okay? Because I, I was not expecting a church in Sydney that I would pastor in. I was not expecting that I would be traveling back and forth and have different groups that you have to oversee and, and maintain, right? But I look back now and I go, well, it's the experience that I got in the job that God gave me. It was His gift. There was a reason behind it. There was something God wanted to develop in my life. Okay, Even though it was difficult. Even though there were times of darkness and I was frustrated, but I realized that there was a purpose behind it. That's where you find the joy. When you can go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm struggling in this area. I know you want me to find joy in this area, but I just don't know what it is, Lord. Can you give me wisdom? Can you help me understand? It's more likely God is trying to work in you, do something in your life to help you mature, to help you grow, so you can be effective for Him sometime later in your life. Okay? But we learn that by being close in the presence of the Lord, by being at His right hand. There are, there are pleasures forevermore. There is fullness of joy in His presence. Let's pray.